looking for some plants to add a little sophisticated style to your garden? Hey, we've got a half hour full of garden style coming up right after this. I'm Alan Smith, welcome to the show. In today's show, what we're going to do is talk about gardens with style. And we've got some plants that I hope will inspire you to add a little spark into your garden. Some of them include a showstopper like this. This is Euphorbia Diamond Frost, one of my favorites. Talk about a long season bloomer. Or what about these? They look like plants from out of this world, but they're actually succulents. And they look great in both what's retro and modern. I'll also take you to this lovely public garden in Hot Springs, Arkansas, where an acclaimed landscape artist is positioning boulders and stones in amazing ways to bring peace and tranquility to an already natural setting. And that reminds me of tea, which is something most of us drink to calm and relax us. We caught up with an importer of high quality Chinese teas, and you've got to stick around to find out about the sweetener I'm using. We've got a great show coming up, so stick around. The beauty and tranquility of Garvin Woodland Gardens in Hot Springs, Arkansas is not lost on the visitor. This woodland garden setting is something to behold in every season. There are many people who have applied their skills to create this garden and make it feel like it's in harmony with the natural setting. David Slauson, a landscape artist with a particular passion for bringing Japanese influences into this garden, tells us about the art of bringing large stones into the project. So I'm working with the natural shapes of the rocks, I mean, we don't really change them at all, and finding the shapes that best evoke the quality of that particular part of the waterfall. The rocks are, are like the bones, the bone structure of the landscape. In any rocky area, which, you know, most of Arkansas is, if water is running, it's it's going to expose those rocks. It's going to erode the, the soil away and work its way down to the bedrock. So that gives us a very deep and grounded feeling when we see rocks that are exposed and set in a compositional way that is oriented, like you'll see if you look through here, how rocks are oriented to the direction of the flow of the stream, as though that's what made the stream turn and bend as it does. They shouldn't look like they were set there on top of the land. They should look like they came from underneath, from the bedrock, and had worn down. You know, so much of it is really about listening, first of all, to the site, and secondly, to the rocks, to the plants. How would they best fit that setting? The design is a response to the natural setting. Now, not all settings are natural, and if they're not, then you seek to create something that seems like it belongs there. Not far from where David is working today is the Anthony Chapel. There, we caught up with architect Maurice Jennings, who tells us about this inspiring chapel in the forest. Well, we were very fortunate uh, to have such a lovely site to, to start a construction prog project. Uh, it's very easy to see where the inspiration for this chapel came from when you look out into the woods and see the pine trees where they're coming up and rising out of the earth and branching at the top. Here in the chapel, we get almost a type of a fan vault, which really makes the structure very rigid. And we use several small pieces in lieu of a few large pieces. So that's where we had this cross bracing on the interior of the chapel. We did choose to use here, as far as materials, we chose a native stone, which is quarried and, and picked up here in Arkansas. And then the wood, the structural material, is a southern yellow pine, which was uh, provided by the Anthony's. And that was actually harvested here very, very locally, very near to the chapel. You find very few structures now built out of this heart, uh, structural dense yellow pine like this is. Uh, but we were lucky and fortunate to have that available to us. Here, what we're trying to do is to allow the person to have a very meditative, relaxing experience where they can 
experience their best thoughts. There's probably, I know of no uh, stronger manifestation of a higher being than what we see in nature itself. Certainly there are many aspects of Garvin Woodland Gardens that inspires a natural style for the home garden, don't you think? Well, when we come back, we're gonna take a look at some great plants that can bring a modern, if not retro twist to your interior or exterior decor. And a little later, tea from China, what one importer has to say about selecting the best leaves for her brew. I've been called a lot of things in my life, a plant collector, a plant nerd, a plant geek, just suffice it to say that I love all kinds of plants, particularly new and interesting ones like these. Recently, I had an opportunity to go to California and meet up with a friend of mine, Margie Ryder, who loves succulents of all kinds and uses them in the most interesting ways. You know, I've admired your work for years and I think it's some of the whimsical things that first caught my attention, like you have here the dog, the purse, the teacup, the star. I can see you've even added a shoe to the Margie line. Yes, Alan, and you know, originally it started out with my geometric shapes, and then I decided why not take that concept and use it in more topiary shapes. When you start, uh, you obviously have some forms here. I guess you start with a wire Do you wire know, if we start with this um, metal, galvanized metal form, and it has to be really heavy form because succulents are heavy. Yeah. So if you do chicken wire, it's not going to hold up yeah. and it's, it's got to be last. up to the job right okay and um, then you're going to always use moss sphagnum moss is what we use and we try to make sure it's fresh yeah and moist and moist yeah always have it wet before you use it and then we use copper wire to wrap it with now in some instances I've seen people use uh, fishing line yes and I use copper wire because it's going to last longer absolutely and you'll see that we've wrapped it here and you can't really see the soil but the soil is in the so middle you sort right of here. packed it in the core of the wreath okay and then this one it looks like you're you're underway with this yes one. this is a the beginnings of a planting look at that you're going to take your forceps and then we're just going to make a hole oh I see so you give it a little start and then you're going to just stick that in there and the tighter you can get it in there, the better it's going to be. And then what you have is it's going to be wet. So of course you're going to, when you're finished wrapping, your wreath is going to be wet. It's always going to work better if it's wet. Mm. Then you don't want to rewater it until it totally dries out. Because if you water it too much, the roots of the succulents aren't going to form because they have such little roots anyway yeah. that the water just kind of washes them away. So and you would also, in a wreath, you wouldn't want to maybe hang it up immediately, no, would you? No, you'd probably wait a couple weeks. Let it begin to root in Let a little bit. Let it begin to root. In the summertime, it's going to root in a couple weeks. In the wintertime, it's going to maybe take four weeks. The less you do with them, the happier they are. Margie, this is just fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Up next, we'll meet up with one of Margie's co-workers who tells us about this plant that has become a favorite in my garden. And a little later, a tour of an inspiring garden full of great ideas. Now take a look at this little guy. This is a bat face kufia. And this variety is called Totally Tempted. It has non-stop bright red blooms like this all throughout the summer. It can make explosive impact in hanging baskets, beds, borders, or in any combination. Totally Tempted works best in full sun, so remember that. Now you may look at these flowers and may think this is a delicate plant. It's a real toughie, so give it a try. You know, as a plant nerd, I'm so excited by the fact that every year I get to trial some new and interesting plants. Several years ago, I started with this one, Euphorbia Diamond Frost and I just love it. I like it because it's so versatile. It'll take some shade and it'll really flourish in full sun. Now when I plant it in the shade, a perfect combination plant is one of the Catalina series terrenias, like white linen, if you want a monochromatic pure white scheme, or even some of the blue ones add such beautiful contrast. Now if you want to grow diamond frost in full sun, you might plant it with this super tunia. Just look at this bloom, it's absolutely gorgeous. This one's called Bordeaux. And just think about this as a combination in the flower border. These gorgeous purple super tunia blooms in combination with the diamond frost, pretty yummy, huh? 
Now while I was out in California, I also had a chance to meet up with Matt Mark, who's originally from Germany, but spends his time now searching the globe for new plant introductions and trialing them at Euro American before bringing them into our gardens. We bring in plants from all over the world. Uh, we're standing here in Euro American's research and development facility, and the plants behind us are really in the last phases uh, of the testing. A lot of these have been developed over the last three or four years, and then we bring them here from dozens of countries to test and try them for the North American market and for the gardeners here. Well, one of the uh, probably most outstanding introductions in the last few years has been uh, Euphorbia diamond frost. And he found this uh, Euphorbia species that was really not commercially developed. Diamond frost uh, is, for example, a, is, a, is a very intriguing plant. When we originally discovered it there in South America, as a uh, it was just a wild species growing there in the, in the bushes in, in Colombia. Uh, it was not as compact as the variety is now, so through selection process, we tried to find a plant that has much more appeal. Uh, as I said, the original plant was, was leggy, really didn't behave as nice in the hanging basket or on the flower bed as, as it does now. So we selected it to be more compact, be more floriferous, and have just overall better longevity for, for the uh, end consumer and in your garden, so you can enjoy it. Garden designers always enjoy a challenge, and Rand Retzloff has been working on this lush woodland garden that is certainly a habitat for different wildlife. During the 2007 International Master Gardeners Conference, Rand got to share his garden with guests from around the country and the world. Several of the people that came through the, the tour we're wondering what kind of fern that was, and it's that spreading yew. And it seems like Arkansas is just bad for the, uh, the southern yew and the northern yew. The Podocarpus doesn't do well in our winters, and the Taxus yew doesn't do well in our summers. But uh, we've, we've managed to get the Taxus yew to, uh, to come on and do real well for us. This is a great bird haven, and you have a nice range of, of different types of birds. It, we were doing really well until a hawk built a nets up in the northeast corner of the property. Uh, and now, you know, if he is out, there is no small bird wildlife. They're, they're scattered and gone. We do have a problem with herons coming to get the koi. We have to put out decoys on the herons to keep them away because they're so territorial but you have to take them out during mating season so we don't attract them to this spot. But uh, the river is close and there are a lot of herons. The sides are deep enough to where we don't have any problem with raccoons. And we've had one spawning and I think we had one this year from the activity of the fish. Well, I've yet to see any babies coming out. But they'll, uh, they'll go over the falls and they'll be stuck in little pockets of, in the river here and then they'll eventually make their way down. Uh, our accent pieces are a uh, crustaceous limestone, very heavily pitted, covered in lichen and moss. And our, our creek rock is, is just that, it's, it's creek rock. And we do like they do in nature, where the big pieces get pushed to the side and you have the gravel and the smaller pieces in the center and just replicate what uh, nature has done fill in the bottom and cover it in gravel and then let her go. Now up next, a tasty tea with a sweet side. And I'll tell you about an herb that I'm growing that's amazingly sweet. Mm, that's good. As a southerner, I'm used to drinking tea in just about every season. I love iced tea to cool off in the summer, and of course, hot tea to warm me up in the winter. Recently, we met Heather Isbell, owner of Izzy's Restaurant in Little Rock, Arkansas. So you might think Heather is going to talk about iced tea. Well, just hold the phone. Heather has been importing tea leaves from China and has an incredible story to tell us. One of my favorite teas is this organic green tea that's actually grown on a farm in China that uses earthworms. So it's all completely organic. And it's one of the highest quality green teas that I've seen come through. And it's, it's just a beautiful tea. It cups up into a really nice amber color. 
You'll see how big these leaves are. This is what green tea really looks like. All these leaves are hand-picked and they just use the very, very top of the plant, the 10 days growth, 10 to 15 days growth off the top of that plant. So you're getting the most antioxidants and the most nutritional value out of, out of the top of this growth on these leaves. So you're getting the highest quality possible green tea that you can. So you're getting all the good things for you. Another one of my favorite teas is this pu'er. This is an aged green tea Brews up very dark. A lot of coffee drinkers love this pu'er. Great thing about this pu'er, this aged green tea, it's very earthy, it's, it's aged in caves or underground. This is, is an oolong tea. An oolong tea is very, very treasured in China. It's, um, this is a very high grade of oolong, and you can see it, it starts out in these little balls of oolong, and it's gonna roll out into a big, giant leaf. I also use this hot water dispenser. It keeps your water regulated at, a, at any temperature you want between 175 and 208. I use 195. That's about the perfect temperature for all your teas. One of the most important things to know about Chinese tea is, number one, it's so good for you and so healthy for you, but it's also very easy and convenient to do. Okay, let's say you like the idea of trying interesting teas from China, but what about sweetener? Well, if you're like me, of course, honey is a natural choice, but recently I discovered an herb that is very sweet. It's been used by the Guarani Indians of Paraguay for hundreds of years. This herb is called Stevia robaldiana, or sweet leaf, because of the sweet taste of its leaves. This plant is an annual, and it grows well in containers or raised beds where the plants can stay moist, but not too wet. If you shop Whole Foods or nutrition stores, you can find stevia as a nutritional supplement. You just can't believe how sweet this herb is. It's really fantastic, and the thing about it is you can collect the leaves and dry them, or you can use them fresh, and it's the leaves you want to pick. The stems aren't nearly as sweet as the leaves themselves. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, we've gotten some great information about some up and coming plants and seen ways to bring style into our gardens. Now remember, all of the information in today's show can be found on my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. garden I dream of a bed of flowers bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us and every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh No, I can't help but smile.